one of them must have had 36 solar masses, 36 suns in one spot. The other one was about 29 suns on the other spot, in spiraling toward each other, coalescing to form a third one. The third one was about 62 suns. And we've never seen something like this. Now, if you're careful, 36 and 29 don't add up to 62. There's a discrepancy. Three solar masses, three suns, three suns, three suns disappeared. And they got converted into energy. Now, we believe that the only energy form that was emitted from that particular signal uh, was, only to, was only emitted into what we call gravitational waves, gravitational radiation. And according to our understanding of the universe, uh, this is the present time, no light should have been emitted. So this is truly, if you will, a quiet event, cataclysmic in nature, but invisible for us. In, you know, you can't see this stuff. You just can't see it. So we have a scenario that goes like this. All right, so this event, last year in September, we registered the signal. It took us about three to four months to analyze the data. Well, I mean, actually, we, we received it one particular day. We were aware we received it. We were in shock. And then we took four months scratching our head, trying to understand if we did something wrong, you know, what, in what state were the machines, and so on and so forth. Anyway, February, four months later, we published the results, headline news everywhere, front page of the Times, Washington Post, CNN, so, so on and so forth. But I can tell you that, that to me, the striking, one of the striking things was actually walking in the subway, in the subway car, and riding the subway train like I do every day, and then looking at this ad, which says scientists found gravitation waves in outer space, if only were that easy to find an apartment in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I think it was the month of February or March where at the end you run into these things, and it's really just struck you know, how this discovery in the end got uh, uh, had an impact in our culture. So gravitational waves. What are these gravitational waves? What do we actually do? Well, it all starts with this gentleman here, Sir Isaac Newton, and he provides a framework for understanding the universe. That framework for understanding all high school students taking physics. No. And it's referred to as, as the law of gravitation. So we know that at the end, if you have an object here, and if you have an object there, there's going to be a force between them. And the yeah, little formula, you plug in the numbers, you get the uh, the force, great. Uh, this framework is absolutely phenomenal. With this framework here, the little formula that high school students know, you can figure out a lot of stuff. You can figure out why tides work. You can figure out why, well, again, how things fall. You can figure out, you know, the, the moon orbiting the Earth, the planets orbiting the sun. You can send probes out to the solar system can have probes land in Mars, all because of this framework of understanding. It's a big deal. It works. All this is great. But even Sir Isaac Newton, when he was writing this stuff down, he was a little bit, he didn't quite understand how this, how can this be? There's this, this force between two things. His argument is very valid to this day. I mean, you have an object here, you have an object there. And we keep telling the students there's a force between them, and the students go, yes, sir, there's a force between them. <laughs> so they figure out the forces. But how is it that one thing knows of the existence of the other thing? How is it, in the end, that one mass needs to figure out what the distance of the other mass is to figure out what the force is? There must be some way for them to communicate, perhaps. But then, if they communicate, there should be some delay. And there's no delay seen. Right, for example, before I just showed you that light takes time to travel from one spot to the other. So how can this thing be, be instantaneous? There were issues. Right? He knew that there were issues, but hey, I can explain a lot of the universe back then, centuries ago. And so I'm going to write the stuff, I have to write the stuff down, because it works, and so he does. But still there were these questions, they were like, mm, 
and something is missing, something is missing. It's only when this gentleman here comes along and he provides another framework of understanding. It doesn't, um, it doesn't actually say that Sir Isaac Newton is wrong. It doesn't say that. It just says, well, he provides another framework of understanding for the universe that is so much more powerful than before. He can explain, I'm sorry, I skipped it. He can explain, no, this is right. He can explain tides and planets and so on and so forth, but he can tell you a lot more. And whenever this gentleman you know, proposes ideas, they were, they were radical ideas every time. They turned out to be all true, but truly radical. Okay, what's his radical idea? Well, his framework of understanding, essentially, which is what we call general relativity, essentially says, well, <clears throat> well guess what? Gravity should not be thought as a force. Gravity is a property of space-time. Difficult to digest. Property of space-time. So we have to dissect a little bit in order to find out what he meant by space-time. I mean, Einstein proposed many, many things, and they were all of them radical. One of the radical ideas, absolutely radical ideas, is the fact that in the end, time is not an absolute quantity. Time is a relative quantity. What is that? It means that I have my watch. I have my own biological clock. And you guys also have your own watches, your own biological clocks. But it turns out that he claimed, and it was true, and it's true, that if you were to run really, really fast, how fast? Well, if you run as fast as possible, approaching the speed of light possibly, your clock should slow down with respect to other persons that are not moving. Therefore, you know, supporting the idea that time is a relative quantity. A movie came out last year or the year before called Interstellar. Interstellar plays with this notion very much. The evolution of time, how time evolves, you know, different frames of reference and things like that. Truly, I, I highly recommend them. Um, so, anyway, so he says that time is a relative quantity and therefore, we should not be thinking that we live in three dimensions. We should really be thinking that we live in four dimensions. Uh, space, spatial, up and down, the vertical axis, left and right, forward and back, that's three, and time, and that's four. We should be living in four dimensions. You can't picture four dimensions. We can picture three dimensions, we can't picture four. But he says, well, we should really think in those terms. We live in four dimensions, okay? We live in, 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 in four dimensions. That four dimensional space is called, it's called space time. That's what it meant. So then, going back to this statement, gravity is not a force, but a property of space time. It's a property of this four dimensional space. What happens? Well, there's a little, actually, a little image here. The sun is here. The Earth is here, and now we're going to pretend that this four-dimensional space called time can be represented by a grid. The grid, let's say, by a plane. And the plane is shown here. The fact that the map, the fact that the sun is right there, the sun has the property of warping space-time, of curving space-time. Now the sun <coughs> has its own warping. And the Earth, this guy here, does his own warping as well. So it warps space-time. Okay. It's almost as if uh, there's another ex analogy that we can take. I mean, if you imagine a trampoline, you take a bowling ball, you place the bowling ball in the middle of the trampoline, the trampoline will sag. The trampoline, the surface of the trampoline, represents space-time, if you will. The act of placing the bowling ball in the middle of the trampoline, the trampoline sags, okay? It's, it actually tells you what general relativity is predicting things, you know, mass would do to space time, if you will. That's the first piece. The second piece is, if you go back to the analogy of the trampoline and the bowling ball, now take from your pocket a few marbles, you throw them on the trampoline, and you know that the marbles are attracted to the bowling ball, but not because the bowling ball has mass, because the marbles sense that the trampoline surface is warped, is curved. Therefore, they want to follow the path of the trampoline. They move accordingly. And that's general relativity. John Wheeler, a famous physicist, 
said general, essentially in one sentence, you know, represent the general relativity completely, mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells mass how to move. And that's general relativity. Okay. Now, last piece, gravitational waves. There is an idea that this gentleman predicted, but he dismissed right away. He predicted it, he wrote a little paper on it, other one that, right? Put the numbers in, and then said no, out. Because the effect is truly very small. Anyway, so imagine, if you take the example with the trampoline, the bowling ball, imagine something cataclysmic happens to the bowling ball. For example, some, for some reason, the bowling ball starts to shake. Start to shake. Bowling ball shakes, then the shaking that the bowling ball undergoes actually creates ripples on the surface of the trampoline. And these ripples travel out. Okay? Same thing in, in, uh, in, in real life with general relativity. If for some reason a star undergoes a cataclysmic event, something cataclysmic, okay? For example, it shakes, something crazy like this. It begins to shake for some reason. Ripples are created on the surface of the space-time <coughs> metric, on the space-time, on, on this grid, and they travel <coughs> outwards. We call those <coughs> perturbations, those changes, those ripples, gravitational waves. Something cataclysmic has to happen, because it has to be a big <coughs> event. These perturbations are truly very, very small, difficult to measure, and the only chance for you to measure, for us humans, it turns out that you have to have something truly very massive undergoing something cataclysmic. And if you're going to undergo something cataclysmic, you have a chance to, to measure something like this. OK, so could you run this simulation? <coughs> um, this is the simu same simulation that you saw before. Two black holes orbiting around each other. Underneath the black holes now, we, make, we present a plane. The plane is a representation of space-time. Supposed to be flat. But because we have two black holes orbiting around each other, it's warped and right underneath it. And that tells you how space-time is.